Um, I, uh, I have a uh, mentor I meet with regularly, uh, two mentors, actually one is an 85-year-old retired pastor and another one is a 65-year-old retired pastor and that's who I get to hang out with in my life for that small group kind of intimate discipleship. So uh, awesome, awesome. Someone once told me that um, if, if you crave deeper spiritual intimacy with another person, that's a sign of true spiritual growth. Let me put it this way. This is not the end of your spiritual journey coming to church on Sunday morning. This is the beginning. Amen. It's, it's going deeper into those pathways that, that Ryan talked about that are so important. So you know you're a true disciple of Jesus if you desire deeper, more intimate growth with other people. So I'll leave that with you. We'll pray that the Spirit convicts you in these areas because that's a good thing that the Spirit does. Amen? Some of you are like, no, I don't like conviction. So <laughs> how about music this morning? I think John Mayer showed up and played lead guitar during the music today. So I'm going to tell you right now, saucy guitar always takes my, the, my, my mute, the worship through music to a higher level. So thank you for the saucy guitar, Miguel. I appreciate it. Luke 18 is where we're going to be. So as you're turning there, uh, reminder, next Sunday, we start age-specific kids ministry. If you have kids 0 to 8, first service is your service. If you have kids 9 to 13, second service is your service. So, and if you got kids in both, well, you'll have to figure that out on your own. So um, 0 to 8 uh, is, is first service, 9 to 13 year olds, second service starting next week. So uh, be praying for that. That's going to be awesome, awesome, awesome. Tonight at my house, uh, end times discussion, that's going to be great as well. Um, yet today, what we have in front of us is an important, important topic. So turn to Luke 18, if you would, with me. Um, Here's one thing, if you haven't realized it yet, is that religion can be very deceptive. What do I mean by that? Religion can be very deceptive. I'm curious, open floor right now. Religion can be very deceptive. What do I mean by that statement? If you're a believer, everything will be perfect. Okay. If you're a believer, everything would be perfect. Almost kind of puts the onus on like, um, if I'm doing what's right, everything's just going to fall into place, right? How many of you believe that? It's not, it's not biblical, but yeah, what, what else? Uh, that your, it'll, there's only one word. Everybody has their own way of saying the same thing that's coming from the Bible. Okay. It's not necessarily the same thing. Okay. We interpret it differently. People can interpret things, that, which can be deceptive. Yeah, it can be deceptive practice. What else? Religion can be very deceptive. What does that mean? This side. Spirit needs to work over here right now. <laughs> Who, who's got it? Who's got it? Rituals. Rituals. We'll get you into heaven. Okay. Works. Okay. Each of you just kind of pinpointed it, right? Works. Which is, which is interesting because Jesus came to blow up that kind of mentality. You know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I grew up, I'm a pyromaniac at heart. I love fire. Anyone else like fire out there? And not only do I like fire, I like blowing things up with fire. Anyone else out there like that? Uh, I love blowing things up. And, and as soon as there's a bit, YouTube knows what I like. It sends me videos of things being blown up. And it just knows, like, it, this has my attention. Uh, this week, Switzerland blew up a snowman because this is their ritual. So, you know, like we have Groundhog's Day, right? The groundhog appears. If it sees its shadow, what? It's, it's longer winter. Well, in Switzerland, they blow up snowmen. And I don't know. You know, I'm not Swiss, and I don't want to judge them, but I think they're heathen. But other than that, um, they blow up snowmen. And the faster the snowman disseminates, the sooner summer will come. So I guess when you're in Switzerland, you want summer to come. So uh, 13 minutes this past week, which means summer's going to come early for them. Yay! whatever that means. <laughs> but, but Jesus wants to blow up things in our lives. And the, the heart of what Jesus wants to blow up, I see consistently through the Bible, is this idea of a ritual-based religion, this works-based righteousness. Jesus wants to blow anything that has any semblance of you involved, he wants to blow it to smithereens. And that's what he's going to do this morning by by isolating this topic in a very well-known parable between the Pharisee and the tax collector. See, at the heart of what Jesus teaches is that he's going to turn everything that this world teaches us to be true, to turn it over on its head. I mean, the paradoxes that exist within the New Testament are amazing, are they not? Let me, let me just, by way of reminder, uh, it's the poor he makes rich. It's the weak he makes strong. It's the foolish he makes wise. It's the guilty he makes righteous. It's the dirty he makes clean. It's the lonely he loves. It's the worthless he values. It's the lost that he finds. It's the have-nots who suddenly become the haves. 
I mean, this is Jesus, right? The paradox is amazing and that we would not think that the way to God is through poverty and weakness and the having not, nothing. But yet this is the very place he has to start. If he doesn't blow us up, there's no room for him to get in. And this is what the parable is about this morning. It is one of the most well-known parables. And it continues on the theme of praying. Last week, we talked about persistence in praying. You remember the, the nagging widow and the reluctant judge. And Jesus commends the woman for her persistence. And Jesus talks about that today. It's, a, it's about posture. It's about penitence. It's about the unseen part to us, but the seen part of you that's only seen by God. See, it's easy to masquerade in a very religious way. It's easy to attend church and kind of check it off your list. And it's easy to have a Bible and have the thickest Bible in the room. Just wondering who's got the thickest Bible in the room today. Like, man, I, you know, if someone's walking into church like this with their Bible, you know they're spiritual, right? <laughs> the person that, you know, that, that kind of parades their religiosity. See, Jesus says, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the heart that loves and adores God when no one's looking, the lights are off, and it's only God who sees. So we come to Luke 18, and we see this topic of prayer. And I will tell you, praying is probably the most intimate spiritual practice. Like Bible reading, yeah, coming to church, yeah, you know, sharing your faith. Yeah. But praying, this is, the, this is the deepest intimacy you can have before God. My question is, what does this intimacy say about us? What's the posture of your heart? Where, where is your heart before a holy God? Well, we get two characters. So before we get into the parable, you need to understand these two characters. There's first the tax collector. And let me just tell you, words associated with tax collectors in Jesus' day would be scum, despised, sellouts, traitors. Anyone saying, hey, that's what was written in my high school yearbook about me. Anyone in that camp, right? So you know this is the kind of guy this is, right? This is the worst sinner in the community, the tax collector. They were disallowed for public office. They were barred from giving testimony in court. You did not trust these people. Why? Because they existed to prey on society by making a living out of stealing from other people, even people in their own neighborhoods. So the tax collectors, scummy people. Then there's the Pharisee. The exact opposite. So while the, the tax collector is the most sinful, the Pharisee is the most honored person in the community. Why? Because they're the most religious. They were victims of the tax collectors, right? They loved the law of God. They upheld the love of God, the law of God. They were respected due to their religious observance. And so when Jesus tells this parable, you hear the word Pharisee and everyone goes, he's the hero. And then you hear the word tax collector and they go, scum of the earth. But Jesus turns it on his head. He's going to make the scum the hero. He's going to make the despised the hero. He's going to make the, the traitor the hero. I like, I like stories like this. Luke 18, turn there if you would. What do we have when the most righteous and the most sinful are part of Jesus' story? Well, you have a parable that's going to, I hope, speak to our hearts this morning. Verse 9, Luke 18. He also told this parable to certain ones who, now here's the audience. I love when it's clearly spelled out like this. He is speaking to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. So right out of the gate, you know who the audience is. Everyone who trusted in themselves and therefore treated everybody else with contempt. Don't sit here this morning and go, yeah, that's not me. I think every one of us feels a little tinge of this in our lives. So two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God... I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, Democrats, 
Cardinal fans, even like this tax gatherer. I don't know, fill in the blank, right? See, just as soon as I said that, you thought negatively of somebody, didn't you? He's up there just braggadocio, right? Thank you that I'm not like all these other people. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, the sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled and everyone who humbles himself shall be exalted. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So two things we're going to talk about this morning. The first is this, the disposition of merit. So we have the Pharisee who is entering this, he exists in this realm where it's the danger of focusing on your conduct. Notice he's praying, he's fasting, he's tithing, he's doing all these good things, but he's doing them for all the wrong reasons. May we not be conduct focus. May we not be conduct police in one another's lives, right? Conduct and observing conduct is a dangerous thing because conduct has to do with merit. And I'm going to tell you right now that merit is opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is it dangerous? Because here's the problem with conduct and merit. It is a relative standard of justice. Meaning your conduct may look different than my conduct and we can coexist and think that one another, just because it's good for you, it's good for you, let me do my own conduct. It's relative and relativism plays no part in the gospel. Okay, relative standards of justice do not hold up against the scriptures. Because here's the question that Jesus ultimately wants to ask us. Will you stand ultimately on your merit or are you going to stand on the merit of somebody else? Because I'm going to give you a little, snap, a little preview, a little appetizer. It's either you or Jesus that you're going to stand on. What, what's it going to be? This is what Jesus gets to. And so his prayer begins on solid food. Look at, look at this prayer, you guys. Verse, verse uh, 11. God. Good start, isn't it? Anytime you start with God, it, it's going to be good. Like, God, I. Notice the two words. Second word, it begins to fail. The word I appears five times in his prayer. The word God appears one time. What's the focus? It, it, there's, my wife and I talk about music in the church all the time, right? And there's, not, there's too many songs that are sung in the church that have an I focus. And we need more songs in the church that have a God focus. Right? Like, I'm going to do this for you, God, and I'm going to do this, and I'm this, and I'm this. It's like, what's the focus here? You can, you, can, you can polish it up and throw a little Jesus in there once in a while. But if the focus is on you and your activity and your righteousness and your obedience and you, like, what? God, I, dangerous. He starts strong, and yet the second word in, he misses the mark. It begins the reek of this disease called self. Self-absorption, self-satisfaction, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-righteousness. Shall we continue? The work of God in our lives has no room for you. Some of you are like, what? The work of God in your lives has no room for you. Because the moment you get involved, you're entering the danger zone with Kenny Loggins. Ah, way too... What? Sorry. Four things I want to note, to note in this man's prayer. Four things that he's deluded by. Self will delude anything that God wants you to focus on. It will distract you. It will detour you. What other D words can I come up with? That's enough. De deluded by his acceptance. This guy knows he's honored in the community. 
This guy knows that all his pomp and circumstance and all his regalia, the fact that he is a rock star spiritually among his people, he is deluded by his own acceptance in the community. Ladies and gentlemen, be careful what people say about you. Don't believe, don't, don't be that fanboy, fangirl, right? Like, I got all these people kind of giving me props, right? I must be all that. Like, you're not. <laughs> you're not. We can be deluded by our acceptance. Just because you're popular doesn't mean you're powerful. Right? Just because you're, you're, you're widely known doesn't mean that you're, you're widely true, you're widely genuine, you're widely transparent, that you're widely even being used by God in someone else's life. Be careful what people say about you. Maybe read the comment sections of your post. And then you get the real revelation, right? People are nasty, aren't they? Drive by posting, drive by this, right? Don't be deluded by your own acceptance. Uh, number two, you're deluded by access. Think about this guy. He, he walks into the temple because it's the time of day to pray. So he walks in, and when it was prayer time for the Pharisee, they had front row seats in the temple. Let me, let me paint the picture out for you. He moves to the front of the temple precincts, which is a huge, huge uh, area. At the precise hour of prayer, he entered the court of Israel, which not everyone was allowed into, and he draws right near the altar of the burnt offering. This is front row center seats in the temple. And because he had access, he thought he was the superior religious leader of the community. He's right there. I mean, he's smelling the lamb. He's get the first aroma of all the burnt offerings. Who's getting hungry right now? I'm sorry. <laughs> he stood so tall right there in front with all of his scriptures that they called phylacteries attached to their foreheads and attached to their arms. And the way they would pray in the Old Testament was that they would stand up, arms out, head up, eyes open, and pray like you were from Boston. You know, that kind of praying. That's what I'm talking about. It's almost like if I said, hey, Miguel, come on up here to pray. And, M and Miguel came right up here and said, all right, here we go. Father, thank you so much. Like, that's it. That's the image. 200 pounds can hold this. Can, I'm 200, all right? Just so you guys know, there's nothing to worry about about these Ikea tables. 10 bucks, all right? There you go. But, you, but you, get the, you get the picture, right? This guy walked right up to the front, and he thought he was the man. Why? Because he was deluded because of his position. He had access to the front. He was deluded by, number three, his assessment. Notice how quick he is to assess himself, not before God, but before other people. It was almost like he looked around the room and said, oh, I've got, I've got a chump over there that I'm going to pick on. That tax collector, hey, God, aren't you glad I'm on your team and I'm not like that guy? God, I'm not like that adulterer. I'm not like that tax collector, right? He had this initial nod to God, right? One word started off fine, but it essentially turned into this self-congratulatory monologue, this personal eulogy, these uses of, of I. And in order to make himself better, he drags this tax collector into his prayer. And the moment you start picking on other people to make yourself feel better, pride has taken root. Do you know people like this? Are you, are you a person like this? You, it's easy to look around and find someone worse than you to make yourself feel better. Right? And you, and you play the God card, which makes it worse. There's this couple in Florida. Did you hear about this? They, uh, they're, they found this perfect spot for their wedding, 16,000 square foot estate featuring a pool with a waterfall. So this couple invited people to come to, they call it the Wilson Estate. Sadly, the property belonged to a guy named Nathan Finkel who doesn't do weddings on his property. But the couple told Mr. Finkel, God's message told them that they should marry at his house. <laughs> and Finkel said, well, my message is to the police and they're coming to throw you guys off. Yeah. Like, don't play the God card as if, oh, as if you're better because you have God and Finkel doesn't. Right? Here's this guy. He, he exposes the moral failures of others to make his self-esteem increase. If the plight of others 
fuels your pride so that all you can do in using someone else's weakness to promote yourself, you're in the wrong religion. You're embracing the wrong faith. Pride does not delight in growing holiness, but it grows, it, it, it hinders the growth to ability for you to grow, draw near to Christ. Pride makes you feel superior. The gospel makes you humble. And a life that finds secure, security in comparing yourself to others is a deluded faith. Number four, he's not only deluded by his assessment, he's deluded by his actions. And this is what he focuses on. Look at what I do for you, Jesus. Look at what I do. Not Jesus, but God. He doesn't like Jesus, right? But God, look what I do for you. It's a works-oriented system of salvation that leads to pride, and that pride leads to contempt for others, and that's the deadly cycle. This guy has a spiritual resume that won't quit. He is part of the National Pharisee Society. Are you guys part of the NPC? NP, NPS? Yeah. He, he has a bumper sticker on his chariot that says, my kid is an honor roll student at Pharisee High School. My kid cannot worship your kid. That's the kind of stuff that this guy parades. He thinks he's better. Why? Because look at his resume. You guys ever grew up in a church where they did Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, Wednesday, Wednesday night prayer service? Here's what happens in those churches, right? You go to the Sunday morning service because you like the church. You go to the Sunday night service because you like the pastor. You go to Wednesday night prayer because you love Jesus. You guys ever heard that before? See, we think like the more we go to church, the more we're involved with the religious activities, the better we are. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is not true. His lifestyle, he started well with God, but now his life is based upon his discipline and efforts. Let me, can I just say something, and, and I want you to hear my heart in this. We are filled with churches of people that have come to Jesus, but we have yet to find churches that help people encourage one another to grow depending desperately upon Jesus. Can I, can I just tell you, it, it may be, quote unquote, easy to lead someone to Christ. That's one part of your spiritual growth. Where's the person in your life saying, how are you growing in Jesus? Because here's what the church, big C, not necessarily our church, because you guys are perfect. So this is about all those other people out there. Here's the problem. It's all now, you know, grace saves you initially, but it's your work that now carries out the rest of the process. We are forever, continually, ever dependent upon the grace of God to work in us. Because you don't bring anything to the table. You know what you bring to the table? Nothing. Brokenness. A spiritual poverty. A spiritual bankruptcy. You bring nothing. And the moment you think you bring something, you are chasing the wrong gospel. Again, I'm all for people coming to know Christ, but I'm ever more for people who have found Christ to be desperate for his work in their lives, which doesn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. Read it this week. Verses 12 and 13. See, he speaks of his vices, this Pharisee. He speaks of some of his vices that he has avoided. And then he talks about some of his pious practices, which he engages. Specifically, he hones in on two things, fasting and, and tithing. And can I tell you right now, these are tangible externals that can be a total misrepresentation of where your heart's at with God. You can come to church. This doesn't mean you love God. You can pray. It doesn't mean you love God. You can fast, you can give, it doesn't mean you love God. And yet they become deceptive practices. Because here's what we see. We see that this, this man's religion, right? He fasted, which means he sacrificed. He, he tithed, which means he was generous. But yes, his religion affected his stomach and his wallet, but it didn't touch his heart. <laughs> it's like I was going through puberty here for a minute or something. <laughs> Okay, I'm all for giving and I'm all for, for fasting, but I am not for a religion that says, I will never impact your heart. Jesus is against this. Are we? Are, are we good with charades and facades and, and the externals while inside you know your heart is far from God? Because I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus is not for that. 
And it's okay because we try to make it about the externals because we don't want anyone to know the internals. We're scared of what others would think. We're scared of Pharisees who are going to be like, oh, they're going to capitalize on my weakness of my sinfulness, my shortcomings, all my failures. They're going to focus on that to make themselves look better, be, uh, bigger and better. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's wrong. We are messed up. Can I, well, let me rephrase that. I am messed up. <laughs> Some of you are like, don't, don't be, don't be, affir okay, affirm it. <laughs> The Pharisees had turned fasting and tithing into a way to gain public approval. Let me just tell you, this time together is not for one another. This time together is for the Lord. You ever thought about Sunday morning? Yeah, th this is a public context, but the most important part about you being here is it says it shows your solidarity to say we are here to worship God. And I'm not here to impress you, and I'm not here to approve you. We do not exist for that. We are here because some of us, many of us, I hope all of us, have been approved by God because of his grace. And none of us are going to be this, this, this pompous person that says, I've got it all together. I'll be the first to say, I'm the chief of sinners. Thank you for loving me. Will you allow me now the grace to, to fall short and share my weaknesses and share my struggles? I don't, I don't want to be like the Pharisee, right? I don't want to be the guy who, you know, when it comes to, to, to fasting, right? These are the guys that on Mondays and Thursdays, these were the fast days. So mark those on your calendar, Monday and Thursdays. You know why they pick Monday and Thursdays? Because Monday and Thursdays in the Jewish culture were market days and people would come from the country into town and the Pharisees, if they looked all, all fast-like, you know, just, just gout and like, you know, putting like dirt on their face and be like, oh, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. All the people would see that and go, nice job. <laughs> it's, it's all a show. So these Pharisees were masters in this. And yet there was a great disconnect between them and God. There's no sense of sin and no sense of a need for humble dependence upon God. Because guess what? You got this. If you get to a point in your life where you don't need God, you have missed the gospel. I was talking to my wife the other day, which we do often. We talk. Um, she reminded me that when she was in fifth grade, she was part of a program in school where you basically uh, graded your own work. I, I want to be a part of an of a educational program like that, right? Like they could write in any grade they wanted. It was part of something that was going on in California, go figure, uh, late 70s, <laughs> go figure, um, where these students would go and they'd really, they'd, go, they'd share work, they'd copy off one another and just give whatever grade to themselves they wanted. So then Lori's family picks up and moves to Arizona and they go to a public school and they look at what she knows and because she's graded her own stuff, she really didn't learn anything. They held her back a year. Why? Because they're like, we're not going to trust this relative standard of education. We have an absolute standard of education. And that story reminded me of how we approach God sometimes. Is this a great, is this a give yourself your own grade kind of religion, God? And, you know, we give ourselves A's, you know, maybe A minus. I know some of you are a little more humble, right? It's like, no, I'll, A plus, way too high. A, I'm going to give myself an A minus unless I look, uh, you know, like I'm bragging. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're going to grade your own religion before a holy God, every single one of you and me, we get an F. Because there's no relative standard of justice with a holy God. You all get an F if you're going to grade your own work. Because the absolute standard of justice is Jesus. And with Jesus, everyone gets an A plus. Right? And it's not, and it's not arbitrary in the sense where I had a teacher in high school, Mr. Finch. Flip the coin for the grade at the end of the semester. <laughs> Seriously. This guy, you go up to him and you could have just missed every single test, not turned in any assignment, and basically your end grade was an A or F based on a coin flip. What was his name? Do you remember? I didn't have to. You didn't? Lucky. He would have given me. Yeah. 
But he basically says, you know, if you didn't do any work, you've got an F, but you have a chance to turn that F into an A based upon calling heads or tails. Are you kidding me? You guys want, it's a 50-50 chance. Can I, can I want, I want you to leave here with 100% certainty that you got an A plus before God. But you have to know it's not a coin flip and it's not a grade your own religious assignment. It's point number two, where you have to have a disposition of mercy, the delight of focusing on God's character. Notice, this is not about your conduct. This is about God's character. This is not about your behavior. This is about what do you believe about God? Because this has nothing to do with merit, your merit. This has to do with mercy. Mercy is one of those words that perhaps we've kind of thrown about and we, and we don't fully understand. But mercy is God withholding from you something that you deserve. But he doesn't give it to you. Grace is being given that which you don't deserve. Mercy is being held back what you do deserve. There's the difference. Notice the prayer of the tax collector. So with the Pharisee, way off. I'm sure it's eloquent. I'm sure it's loud. I'm sure it's just up there, up front. Everyone knows about it. But here is the tax collector who can't even come near. He is at a distance that doesn't even want to approach anybody else. He is living in this, this isolation where he can't even lift his head. He is bowed in prayer. And I'm going to tell you, this may be the verse where his head is bowed that tells us when we pray, bow your heads, close your eyes. Because the Old Testament, this was praying, eyes wide open, standing up, arms open like this. This could be the verse that taught the church for the past 2,000 years to bow your head and close your eyes when you pray. Is that interesting? Yeah. But it's the fact that you can't even lift your head because you understand the character of God and you understand your conduct as a person. And there's two things that happen in that kind of heart. There's confession and there's contrition. Those are the two blanks in your notes. Mercy in confession and mercy in contrition. If I can give you alternate words, there is a mercy that happens when you are bowed and there's a mercy that happens when you are broken. And notice the prayer, this, how short it is, how simple it is. Everyone can memorize the prayer of the tax collector. And Jesus obviously puts so much importance on this man's prayer because it reflects his heart that we ask ourselves, why do we complicate things? How about using this as your prayer on a day-to-day -day basis? God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That's it. That's his prayer. And Jesus hears, it's simple, yet it's profound. And Jesus says, that is the man who goes home justified. Because he is bowed and he is broken. Now let's unpack this because this is so, so important. He is understanding God's absolute standard of justice. He is not going to stand on his merits He's going to stand on Jesus' merits. That's the difference in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a choice. Will you stand before a holy God based upon your conduct, or will you stand before God based upon the, the, the character of Christ? That's, those are the only two options. And if you're going to stand on your own merits, here's what I have to say to you. Good luck. It's not going to happen. Because here's what God demands. Absolute perfection. And you've already failed in that one hour ago today. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. Some of you are like, how does he know? Because I'm human. <laughs> the mere thought of this tax collector even praying was gross to people. Everyone gathered at the temple. Here's this tax collector whimpering and crying and praying and they're like oh this is disgusting but notice the contrast Jesus turns this over uh, everything on its head right 
The Pharisee stands in prominence, but yet the, the tax collector stands at a distance. And I'm going to tell you something right now, that isolation is this work of the enemy that says, you are worse than everybody else. You should not go to church. You should not believe, be involved in someone else's life. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's your, it's your spiritual bankruptcy that should drive you to be with people who will love you and accept you as you are where you are. I don't want to be a part of a country club. I don't want to be a part of a country club where I pay my dues, I've got my chair, I've got a great program, there's fog machines, there's tight jeans, and there's big screens, you know, all that stuff. But I want to be a part of a church community where we understand the importance of being bowed and being broken. Because all I know is that some people want to live their lives in a spiritual way where it's so polished it doesn't, it doesn't invite those who are isolated in. This is not a country club, this is a hospital. This is a place where broken, bowed people who would rather stay at a distance because they understand the gravity and weight of their sin, their spiritual poverty, and yet there's a community of people that says, we love you exactly where you are. Because you're not just a sinner, you feel like the sinner. Notice the words, verse 13. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He thinks he's the worst. How many of you think you're the, don't raise your hand. How many of you think you're the absolute worst sinner? I mean, isn't this what Paul says in, in First Thessalon, uh, First Timothy chapter 1, verses 15, 17? Notice what Paul says and how this connects to the mercy of, of God. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. <laughs> this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, is that not good? God works his best work in and through broken people. God does his best work through people who don't exalt themselves, but who humble themselves. This is why 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is on the screen, but his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Why do we feel as if we need to come before God and prop ourselves up? God says, you come to me broken and bowed and let me lift you up. It's tiring trying to lift yourself up. It's, it's tiring try to, trying to keep up with all the pomp and the circumstance. It's, 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 it's tiring trying to be to out-religious one another. It's tiring. And you know what? Let's just keep it simple. Just, just chase Jesus and love Jesus and adore Jesus and, and, and let him do the rest. Don't get so fixated on, oh, what do I need to do to be a Christian? You know what you need to do? Nothing. Love. Adore. Worship. Psalm 51. The the prayer of this tax leader is right out of the Psalms. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. There's an awareness of how far we fall short of the glory of God. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother did conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and that I shall be clean and wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Don't miss the phrase. Restore to me the joy of your. This is not your salvation. This is his salvation in you. 
Ooh. This is a cry of confession. Perhaps we can learn from Paul. Perhaps we can learn from David. It's one thing to publicly announce your virtues. It is quite another to proclaim your sins. Who's ready for that? Who's, who's ready for that? I don't want to hear how well you parent your kids. I want to hear about how you fail. I don't want to hear how great your marriage is. I want to hear how you struggle. I don't, I don't want to hear how, how, man, my walk with God is rocking. I want to hear how it sucks. Like, when you, when you enter that level of honesty, like, my wife and I, I was excited for date day on Friday. You know how we started date day? With a fight. <laughs> this doesn't kindle the flames of romance. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's set, uh, it was a, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's a 7.2 date day. It could have been an 8 something. I, that's honest, right? Like people are, we've got customers like, how is date day? And, and literally on Friday I said, it started with a fight. And then they kind of like walk away like, <laughs> that's honest. That's honest. Awesome. Right? Here's the thing we all know. Is that we know that God's wrath is upon us. Because we know how to really mess things up. We fall short of his glory. And we know that his wrath is upon us. And what mercy cries out is that God, please remove your wrath from me. Because I know the kind of person I am. When he prays, be merciful to me, O God, the sinner. He's saying, I wish there was an atonement for me. Because right now I'm not seeing it. And yet I'm throwing my life at your mercy. And you know what God does? He shows us mercy through the mercy seat. Write down that phrase, mercy seat. The mercy seat was that place on the ark made famous by Harrison Ford, early 80s, greatest action movie ever, just for the record, Raiders of the Lost Ark. So you have the, you have the angels, right, in their wings, and you have this gold-plated top that's holding some really important religious stuff, right? Like, but the place between the angels on top of the ark was called the mercy seat. And the priest would come in and take the blood of innocent, spotless, blameless animals and pour the blood over this golden ark. And that was representative of God's wrath being assuaged for our sin. It was this pure, holy, perfect setting, right, in which blood was poured over this mercy seat and the people temporarily felt God's wrath removed. Hebrews says in chapter 9, Jesus is is the mercy seat. It's the person and work of Jesus Christ who now becomes that place where your sins and God's wrath are met and dealt with. And the, the tax collector says, take the wrath away and absorb my sin, please. I, I'm a broken man. And I, and I understand there's nothing I could do to ever, 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 ever earn eternal life or even your favor. And God says, if you are broken before me, confess your sins and become that broken person. Yours shall be the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who confess their brokenness. And yours will be the kingdom. Isn't it cool? He doesn't say, and then look at the bottom, and then go to church, then pray, then read your Bible, then memorize scripture, and then give, and then fast, and then... Di if you're a bowed and broken believer, you're the believer that inherits the kingdom of heaven. 
And the only way I know to be bowed and broken, and that's not just a one-time deal, that's a regular activity, is that I come in contact with God's character. Because when you come in contact with the living God, because it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God, when you come before him and understand who he is, you can't help but be bowed and broken. If you say you worship God and you're not bowed and broken, you're following the wrong God. This is a God who loves despicable, scummy, traitor people like me. And say to me, you were my enemy, but now I want to make you my friend. Are you flipping kidding me? Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? That's the gospel. Takes the weak, makes them strong. Takes the poor, makes them rich. Takes the have-nots and gives them the haves. I can offer no defense. I can offer no rationalization. I can offer no justification, even though I try. But in the end, it is about not only confession, but contrition, brokenness. And my joy, don't miss this, please. My joy, your joy, does not reside in this idea of deserving, your joy resides in this idea of receiving mercy. Full stop, period. Romans 3. This is what it's about. But now the righteousness of God, not your righteousness, but God's righteousness, has been made manifest apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God does not exist in the law or the prophets. It exists through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned. You know what that means? You, 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 everyone. You've all sinned. And fall short of the glory of God and are justified how? By your works? No, but by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. Notice that word, big word. Let me just break it down for you. Jesus Christ assuages the wrath of God on your behalf. He's the mercy seat. How does he do it? By his own blood. To be received by faith. That was to show God's righteousness. This way is to show God's righteousness. Because of his divine forbearance, which we're thankful for, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is you involved in this? Nowhere. He is both just and the justifier. You know what, what God doesn't do? He doesn't, as a, as a, as a judge, and you're the, the, the one being convicted of a crime called sin, he doesn't make you righteous. He declares you righteous. That's huge. And when you understand this, you realize that according to Jesus, no one is too sinful to be saved. You're only too righteous to be delivered. Did you hear what I just said? You're not, no one in this room is too sinful to be saved. Hallelujah. But if you think you're too righteous, you're lost. We don't give up with our sins intact, ladies and gentlemen, since we have a God who forgives us all sins. Can I get an amen? We don't settle for brokenness since we have a God who heals and mends us. Can I get an amen? We don't quit with our heads hung low since our God lifts our heads and gives light to our eyes. Can I get an amen? We don't keep ourselves distant when we see our sins, but we have a God who welcomes us, accepts us, and, and cleanses us and says, you're now my child. Can I get an amen? amen. You are nothing. He is everything. And for the person who believes that, You'll go home justified. Versus the person who doesn't believe it goes home just like the way they came. Spiritually empty. 
Jesus. Sometimes I don't like Jesus' parables. <laughs> Sometimes I don't like the characters he, he portrays and gives us because I see myself. And what I thought was going to be the hero, I go, yeah, I'm just like that guy. And then Jesus says, you don't want to be like that guy. I'm like, oh, man, crap. I'm stuck. <laughs> Bowed and broken. Poor and powerless. That's what honors God. And all God's people said, Stan, let's pray. Lord, it is an incredible thing that you choose to love people like me. Lord, my heart and my soul, my spirit is ever conflicted. I don't do things for the right reason. I don't do things with the right motives. I fail. When it comes to just being the kind of husband, being kind of dad, being, being the friend that you want me to be. I fall short in so many ways. And yet you're the very God who reaches into my life and says, that's good and that's okay. Because my ultimate dependence is on you, Father. My ultimate hope is in Christ. My ultimate trust is in, in your character. And Lord, while I may think these things of myself, I am never stuck or down in the dumps. But I'm just like that man in Psalm 40 that says, you have lifted me out of the pit and you have set me on solid ground. Because of your grace. Because of your mercy, because of your kindness, you have found me and you have delivered me. And that's not the end. I now, today, still depend upon you. Forgive me for trying to butt in to your work, Father. Forgive me for trying to think I have an edge in this somehow, some way that I can bring something to the table. Father, you alone deserve the glory because I have nothing and you are everything. Be merciful to me, O oh God, the sinner. Be the just and justifier in my heart, my life, my world. And in the end, be glorified, be exalted above everything else. Work in our lives, Father, to this end. And we pray this in Christ, our mercy seat, our propitiator. We pray this in his mighty, magnificent name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. See you tonight for end times discussion.